Dr. Satish Raj has spent most of the last decade studying POTS and other autonomic disorders at Vanderbilt University's Autonomic Dysfunction Center, but returned to Canada not long ago to an autonomic lab at the University of Calgary, where he is an associate professor of cardiovascular medicine. Dr. Raj is an active member of the American Autonomic Society and one of the Dysautonomia International Medical Advisory Board's founding and most active members. We are grateful, very grateful, that he is willing to travel back to the United States to be with us this year, each year actually. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Satish Raj. Thank you all. Uh, I hope the postprandial somnolence won't be, won't be too difficult to, to get through. So this is a, a little bit of a, it's a new talk for me. I haven't actually given this talk, and, and so I hope that it's coherent. Um, but given that it's about brain fog, if it's not, that seems appropriate as well. <laughs> so I've titled it, I Can't Think Properly, Pot, Sleep, and Cognition. Um, <coughs> Lauren didn't ask me to talk about sleep, but I think that probably feeds in a little bit. And I thought we'd go over some of the data that we know about, both from Vanderbilt and from other places that have looked at this. Uh, for those of you who are here waiting till the end, because the answer will be given, um, you might as well nap. Uh, but <laughs> the truth is that there's there's a lot that we need to know, and, and there aren't brilliant answers to the end. It's more a summary of where we're at right now and, and where we need to go. Uh, so uh, this case, uh, some of you may have seen this morning, uh, same case, same patient. Um, I'm not going to read through everything, but briefly say that uh, this represents a fairly typical patient, a prototypic patient that we saw at Vanderbilt. So, woman previously well, 26, came in with symptoms related to tachycardia initially, um, palpitation, chest pain, tremulousness, lots of fatigue, lots of trouble thinking, lots of orthostatic tachycardia, 50 beat increase on standing within a few minutes. You know, and, and ultimately we treated her with a lot of the therapies that many of you have heard about or tried yourself. Might have been through cortisone, both of those didn't take in her for side effect reasons. Ultimately, she went for salt, vitamin B, we switched birth control agents. Talk about that later if you want to know why. Um, DDVP. And with this, we actually improved her palpitation, lightheadedness, and chest pain somewhat. But ultimately, uh, she had to quit her job. And the reason wasn't any longer that she wasn't able to sort of stay vertical during the workday, but she just fundamentally wasn't able to concentrate and think enough, think clearly enough to keep her job. And so this relates to the, the broader issue of cognitive dysfunction in POTS. Um, this is Lauren's picture. If you like it, thank her. If you don't like it, complain to her. So one of the first questions to address is, is is this psychiatric? Um, you know, there are obviously a lot of psychiatric comorbidities, depression, anxiety, that cause very similar symptoms, right? Trouble with concentration, trouble with memory, uh, trouble with uh, clarity of thought. So this was studied um, several years ago now, actually, uh, at Vanderbilt. Uh, Vidya Raj, my wife, actually did this study before, as a research fellow, before doing her psychiatry training. And there were several things that were done, uh, very structured assessments on patients that came to the Vanderbilt Clinical Research Center. Um, and one of the things I looked at was, was the Beck Depression Inventory for depression scores. And you can see here, patients with POTS scored in the mild depression category. So between 14 and 19, they're sort of around 15, plus or minus. Um, a little higher than the ADHD control group, much higher than normal control group. I presented a slide like this, at another talk this morning. Uh, if you weren't here, it's important to know that these normal controls were screened in advance to determine if they're psychiatrically normal. Um, my wife quite proudly told me that I would not have qualified. <laughs> so this isn't a general population comparator. This is actually people that have been screened out. This so there's mild depression. Looked at anxiety and, and the different ways of doing this and different tools. The, the better tool these days is probably the Anxiety Sensitivity Index, or ASI. 
Um, in this study, again, the POTS patients were in the mildly anxious category, higher than the normal population. But importantly, comparable, anything probably less than the general population. Right? So there wasn't actually an excess amount of anxiety symptoms, which is what this is picking up. The one key thing that was abnormal is that they used a, a rating scale related to um, ADHD. So this is actually you know, what all Connors stands for, but it's basically a Connors ADHD score, and there are different scores related to attention and hyperactivity, and this presents the inattention scores. And you can see that compared to the normal population, the ADHD population has a lot more inattention or attention problems compared to normal. The POTS patient in red in the middle is middling, right? So there, the attention in this group is not as bad as the ADHD population of the study, um, but was significantly worse than the healthy controls, and actually, in this case, worse than the background population as well. There, uh, so Vivia is actually presenting a talk, uh, I think, later this afternoon, I think just after this, perhaps, um, that will have more detail on some of the psychiatric study output. This is just a quick summary of that. But the key findings from the studies are they, they in addition to the questionnaires that we looked at, they actually did a detailed structured assessment to see if patients met DSM-4TR criteria, so whether they actually had diagnosable psychiatric illness. And one of the key upshots of the study was that patients with POTS did not actually have an increased prevalence of major depression or anxiety or panic disorder compared to the general population. And this, it was an important finding, I think, because anecdotally, we were getting referrals saying patients anxious, and, and these are things that some of you may be familiar with or not. Um, the key positive finding was the POTS patients had difficulty maintaining attention. Hold that thought, because we'll come back to that in a bit. Um, so I just want to shift to, to briefly discuss some of the work on sleep and POTS. Um, a lot of this work was, was done with me and, and led by Kanika Bagai, one of the sleep neurologists at Vanderbilt. So um, we know that in POTS we focus um, a great deal on the orthostatic tachycardia, uh, in the hemodynamic criteria that we see, the excess heart rates, the, you know, in the absence of significant hypotension. Um, but there are clearly, uh, many of the symptoms derive from that, but there are clearly symptoms that don't seem to have any direct relationship to heart rate. There's more than heart rate. So many patients complain of sleep problems or poor sleep quality. Um, almost universally, patients complain about fatigue. That arguably is, uh, you know, if there's one thing that could be fixed for a lot of people, it's fix my fatigue. Um, they might as well ask me to make the sun blue. But, you know, and many patients will complain of, of something to the effect of poor attention, poor concentration, poor memory. Truthfully, I think what the words that usually I hear is, I can't remember things. Um, you know, but I think this is befuddled and mixed in with concentration and attention. I think it's all sort of a similar paradigm. And, and the result is significant function disability. So in looking at sleep, um, we used the medical outcome study sleep score. So the medical outcome study was a very big study that actually generated what is now the SF36 quality of life tool, but they actually had separate sleep tools. Um, and in that, the POTS patients had a poorer quality of sleep, a poorer sleep score compared to the control subjects, much poorer. The, you know, the average score was in the high 60s versus 30 in the POTS patient. We looked at uh, fatigue um, using a visual analog scale, so we actually asked a very simple question. We drew a line and put zero on one end and said this is no fatigue, and 10 on the other end and said this is the worst possible fatigue, and just asked how fatigued patients were in the last week. And again, the POTS patients were much more fatigued with a score of seven and a half, give or take, compared to under two and a half for control subjects. Now, one can say, well, that's a stupid test. Um, you know, you pass and draw a line. But this has actually been looked at and compared to three other more detailed and lengthy fatigue scores. And actually, um, the correlation is quite good, right? So just it's a quick, simple summary. It could be the patients are too tired to fill out the long surveys. But, but it actually works, as it turns out. So, so there was a series of... Uh, uh, Questionnaire-based studies quantifying sleep, sleepiness, um, 
and the patients did worse on most of them. I'm not presenting most of that data here because of time issues. Um, but this is all self-reports. So we wanted something more objective. And so the next set of the sleep studies involved using actigraphy. So actigraphy basically is uh, some method of measuring motion or activity to try and determine when you're asleep and when you're awake, to try and get quantified times. And we use, in this case, is activity watches or actigraphy watches, a sample watch is shown here. It looked a little silly at the time, because this was several years ago, but nowadays you see people with, you know, these eye watches or whatever they're called, you know, Google watches, you know, that look the same, sort of black and doesn't seem to do anything for you. That's what we did. <laughs> and it turns out they can measure activity as well. We were just a bit ahead of the curve. Um, so basically, this gives you sort of motion and, and you know, it's set up so that if you reach a certain threshold of activity, it gave you a point for being active at that moment in that bin, and if you didn't, it wasn't. So it's not a perfect tool, but it, it sort of gives you some quantifiable data. And we could use that to discriminate periods of quiet sleep from restless sleep or when people were awake when they shouldn't be. And we could get traces. We sent people home and had asked them to record for a week, and we'd get back a trace like this. So here, each is a 24-hour day here. Uh, this is, I think, noon to noon, roughly. And the blue period is when people told us that they were asleep. So we got them to keep a little log. We didn't have to do it at the time, but a little log of when they went to sleep and when they woke up. And we sort of chunked that blue, and you can see that it varied a little, the times varied a little, the patient didn't get, this is a healthy volunteer, but didn't get as much sleep this day, but for the most part, these black periods are periods of activity, more activity, less activity, but activity, and you can see when they're awake, there's a lot of activity, but when they're asleep, there isn't, right? There isn't a lot of movement, there may be an odd little blip when you roll over, but not fundamentally a lot. This is a representative trace from a POTS patient, and you can see that in this period when they should be asleep, um, especially in many of, uh, many of the days in the beginning, there's a lot of activity going on, representing the light blue here, and some which encroaches later. On some nights, there's lots of motion activity in the middle of the night. These are probably periods of waking, of waking up in the middle of the night. Again, all indicative of, of interrupted sleep, if nothing else. You can't comment on restorative, but interrupted sleep, or intrusions into sleep. As a part of the study, we, we did get patients to um, report some subjective symptoms. So there were some questions for each day that were simple on-off questions. Um, you know, were they, did they have restless sleep? So did they have self-perception of how their sleep was at night? Um, again, there was a higher rate, about double in the POTS patients of reporting restless sleep. This is on a per-night basis, right? So they had seven nights, they could you know, have four yes, three no, so that's how we got a percentage. Um, and then, were they tired in the morning? And again, about 80% of the POTS patients reported being tired in the morning after presumably having a good night's sleep. In this case, not so good night's sleep. One of the more interesting things uh, that's come out of the study was um, the whole issue of subjective versus objective reporting. So one of the things we wanted to know about was sleep latency, how long it took to get to sleep. So we actually subjectively asked the question, how long did it take you to get to sleep? Right, so the next morning you sort of report, report in. Um, and subjectively, POTS patients reported that they took an hour to get to sleep from when they were trying to get to sleep, um, while the healthy subjects reported less than 15 minutes on average. But when we looked at it based on the activity values and when they, the time they gave us and then looking at activity, when the activity settled down, the two, uh, the two groups were actually comparable, maybe a little more, a little higher in the POTS patients, but not a lot. And it wasn't one thing. It, it looked like the POTS patients as a group over-reported how long it took to get to sleep, and perhaps the healthy volunteers under-reported how long it took to get to sleep. But there's, a, there's a, a, certainly a discordance. So if we just ask the question, this looks like it's you know, clearly a huge difference, while when looking at the objective tool, we couldn't find that. Uh, this morning, um, I talked about one of the challenges of referral bias coming to Vanderbilt. Um, that referral bias may, might exist at Stanford, but they recently, this year, actually published a, a similar sleep study um, using formal sleep studies, PSGs. Um, but they found a similar dichotomy in the POTS patients versus control subjects on the right, POTS patients on the left. So I've put in letters here for O for objective assessment with PSG and subjective assessment. And when you look at sleep onset latency, again, the numbers a little different in the groups, but Again, there are differences in subjective versus objective reporting. In this case, the control subjects and the POTS patients had differences in the same direction, but 
we all seem to overestimate um, how long it actually takes us to get to sleep compared to how long it's measurable using more formal testing. Um, so our, our final study, um, so what we found is objectively there's certainly uh, intrusions and sort of problems with sleep. We wanted to know if we could sort of get a better handle on what the problems are. And so we did formal sleep studies, polysomograms, or PSGs. So this is a smaller study. We had 16 POTS patients and 15 healthy controls. Uh, in addition to the POTS patients, we had formal posture study and autonomic testing to try and relate to this. The sleep studies were done on our clinical research center for the most part at Vanderbilt. Um, they were standard clinical uh, methods used and, and uh, standard protocols for reporting. Uh, the data doesn't go into this. One patient actually had obstructive sleep apnea. So it wasn't sleep apnea isn't unheard of in this group, but it certainly wasn't a common problem in this group, all of whom complained subjectively in advance of sleep problems. And here is the data from the study. It is small, it is not meant to be read. The key point here overall is that using all of the, these traditional reporting parameters, sleep efficiency, sleep time, different phases of sleep, wake after sleep onset, the details aren't important except to say that there's really no statistical difference in this group between the POTS patients and the control subjects for any of these parameters. And so the bottom line from our sleep work is that the POTS patients have no significant difference in sleep parameters compared to healthy control subjects. Um, but And does confirm the previous actigraphy results but using the uh, more detailed and formal PSG. Importantly, POTS patients as a group, individuals may differ, but as a group, sleep apnea is not a big problem. That's not the reason for sleep problems. It's actually a problem with insomnia. Um, there are different types of insomnia. When talking to sleep people, I get a headache discussing insomnia because they start asking me questions I don't know the answer to. Um, but there's actually, it seems to be a combination of the insomnia that gives you trouble getting to sleep, but there's also insomnia where you wake up in the middle of the night and then can't get back to sleep. And I think we've see, seen a bit of both uh, in this cohort. So then the question is why? And it's not entirely clear, but there is actually in the insomnia literature something referred to as the neurocognitive model of insomnia. Insomnia is a state of cortical, cognitive, and somatic arousal. And there were correlates, and not, uh, we cut out some of that data for time, but there are correlates um, between uh, some, sleep, some of the sleep quality parameters and upright heart rate and other sort of markers of excess sympathetic tone. We weren't measuring cortisols and things like that in the study, but that would all sort of fit with a hyper-vigilant, hyper-aroused state that's sort of consistent with uh, some of the other findings and thoughts. Um, so the real focus of the talk is the issue of, of cognitive impairment in POTS, and I found this on the web. Um, I think you all have this slide. I should clarify in advance. This may be under copyright. I can get permission, so use it at your own peril. Um, but this says, for brain fog, I can't express to you how bad I hate having brain fog. It's embarrassing and upsetting. It's like one minute I'm in a serious conversation about something, and the next minute I forget where I'm at. Wait, what was I talking about again? Okay, so brain fog in POTS. Um, among patients I see, this is a very common complaint, arguably almost universal. The vast majority of patients will complain about this in uh, some form or another. In many cases, it's, it's one of the most disabling of complaints. Um, in many cases, this can be worse when upright, but actually it's a problem described even when sitting or lying down uh, for a lot of people. And, and the descriptions vary from individual to individual, but that's probably true with a lot of subjective uh, symptoms. Um, some people describe it as difficulty thinking, difficulty concentrating or paying attention, trouble remembering things, a cloudiness or a fuzzy feeling in the head, or having problems with word finding. The reality is the precise nature of brain fog has not been described. Um, we've done a study that I'm going to get into that tries to characterize it better, and more importantly, optimal therapeutic strategies have not been described. And I'm not about to hear. Um, but I mean, that's, it's an area obviously we need to try and address. I come back to this slide, you've seen this before. This is from the earlier um, psych study where using the Connors ADHD rating scale, the POTS patients actually had more inattention. This was the only positive finding to fall on from that study. 
So we did a study that, at least internally, we refer to as the origins of brain fog. Um, a lot of this work was led by Amy Arnold, who was a postdoc at Vanderbilt until recently. She's now on faculty at Penn State in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, it is my hope that as she gets settled in, she may sort of develop a POTS research program there. We shall see. So this study actually involved doing a fairly detailed psychometric testing battery. Uh, it is listed here. The psychologists in the group may appreciate some of the details of the test. The rest of you, I suspect, will not. Um, but there were tests of general intelligence, tests of both selective and sustained attention. Turns out that whole attention thing, way too complicated to talk to psychologists, right? There's all these different subcategories, and, and there are different ways of testing different aspects of it. Uh, psychomotor speed and executive function. So executive function, um, for lack of a better phrase, is, is actually what you need to run things. So it's a combination of processing speed, selective attention, all of this sort of falls under executive function. And then tests of different types of memory. Tests of semantic memory, sort of remembering specific things, associative memory, and working memory or short-term recall memory, and then more verbal fluency. So it was a fairly sophisticated and lengthy battery. Um, most of the study was done in fact, everything reported in our paper was done with the patient sitting in a recliner. Right? So we actually weren't in this study trying to assess the orthostatic impact. We were just saying we have this group of patients that describe problems, arguably in their best position. I guess the best position might have been lying down, but some of the paper things are a bit awkward when you're lying on your back. Right? So reclined in a comfortable position with the feet sort of up a little bit. In the best position, we're sort of assessing what we could assess. Um, so this is who we looked at. So there were 24 uh, healthy control subjects, 28 POTS patients um, that were studied. The POTS patients uh, reported a disease duration of 2.2 years. I honestly don't know if this is from diagnosis or from when they thought the illness began. This is self-reported. Um, ages were comparable. Size was comparable. Predominantly Caucasian, again, consistent with uh, other studies that we've done. Um, the POTS patients had an average of four years of university. The control subjects, uh, a little more, not surprising because uh, our healthy control subjects are often grad students um, at Vanderbilt, uh, who are doing study for the purpose of advancing science and not for the money that we pay them. Just want to be clear. <laughs> um, but again, so a slight difference but not highly so, both a fairly educated group across the board. Um, their IQ scores measured with the WTAR, again, comparable and, and above average in both cases. Um, and their seated vitals are seen here, blood pressures are comparable, the heart rate is a bit higher in the POTS group as one would expect. So this is the slide um, with the tests that we did shown that you've seen already. The ones in blue are the ones where there were some differences between the POTS patients and the control subjects. So interestingly, with the memory test, and the RAND, again, is a broad test looking at different aspects of memory, we did not find any differences. Um, we did find differences in tests of looking at selective attention, executive function, processing speed, and, and more executive function. So using uh, the rough two and seven, and how quickly people could, uh, could do this, um, you know, the POTS patients did worse than the control subjects. Uh, statistically significant, uh, you know, again, we have to sort of piece it all together to figure out how clinically relevant it is, but a processing speed issues. Uh, the symbols digit modalities test is a selective attention test. You have to be able to almost use a, a key to decipher a code. It's sort of a version of what it is. It's not a tough code, but a code. So it requires very specific attention. Again, the POTS patients didn't do as well as the control subjects. And the trails B and the Stroop are both tests of executive function. So overall ability to process, it incorporates some speed, some select potentials, or some of the stuff in the previous slide uh, as well. Um, and the POTS patients in both tests of executive function did do the worst. So we were able to find specific deficits of selective attention and cognitive processing in patients with POTS. There are no difference in psychomotor speeds, a sustained attention as opposed to selective attention, or memory or verbal fluency, suggesting this isn't a blanket problem. It's not as simple as brain not getting to head, head not working, right? These seem to be sort of specific 
areas or specific processes that are affected, and other specific processes didn't seem to be affected at all. And this wasn't associated with psychiatric symptoms, so I didn't actually present that data here, but again, as I mentioned in the beginning, depression and anxiety can cause, you know, what is described as brain fog or cognitive dysfunction, so we actually did screen for that, and there were no differences in the two groups. That wasn't the explanation in this case. Um, again, as I mentioned, these problems were observed with patients seated in a recliner. Um, so it's not to say that there were no orthostatic symptoms or orthostatic issues. The reality is they weren't lying flat, but certainly this wasn't an orthostatic stress test that we did it in. Um, so this suggests to us that some of these findings may be part of the broader disorder itself and not due to the heart rate or to the symptoms of standing. It's not that I'm having palpitation and I'm distracted and that's why I can't um, process this information. Um, so to our knowledge, this was actually the first study that actually um, looked at it in that context of, of sort of a more formal neuropsych assessment. I know there are others that I've seen in abstract form. I haven't seen um, other supine things published. Um, but this is probably the beginning, right? We're sort of scratching the surface of beginning to understand sort of the psychological impact. So what about standing? So we did a little bit of standing stuff, but we haven't actually sort of gone and probed that. Um, but Julian Stewart's group uh, in uh, New York Medical College has, has, done, has done some work on this. And so they used a test called the NVAC. It's an exec another executive function test, so an area that we did find abnormalities in, in our patients. So this slide is my attempt to try and show you what the NVAC is. It's a conceptually fairly simple test. Basically, a computer generates a random series of letters. There are certain restrictions of what letters could be. And the N can be N minus one or N, N one back. And what they're saying is, you know, flag the letter that's a repeat of something one back. So in this case, you're cruising along, you have E, D, S, and then another S. That's a repeat of the one back, and so you would flag that S. If it was N2 back, you want to flag if it's a repeat of something 2 back. So you're cruising along at L, C, K, C. The C is a repeat of this letter C, 2 back, and you flag that. And then N3 back and N4 back, same thing. And understandably, it gets harder and harder the, the higher the N back you go, right? Because you have to remember sort of a higher sequence and concentrate and process, and it takes longer to do. As I mentioned, this is work from Julian, uh, and what they showed in the POTS patients in black and the control subjects in gray is that, one, as you get to a higher level of N back, everyone takes longer, right? They control POTS, but certainly that difference seems to get exaggerated in POTS, and at the higher levels of N back, the difference was significantly greater in POTS patients. So there does seem to be a problem they're picking up again worse on standing with higher levels of stress. Um, they looked at different degrees of tilt. They did this repeatedly. Um, and again, with higher levels of tilt, the control subjects in gray really didn't get any worse at the same level of, of N, if you will, while the POTS patients did a little bit. But again, their you know, heart rate's going up and other stuff might be going on. Uh, if you look at their blood pressures, and this is looking not at the systemic blood pressure, it's actually looking at cerebral blood flow velocity, so they had a transcranial Doppler. Their hypothesis was that the changes in cerebral blood flow were going to explain the differences in cognitive impairment. But what you see here is that incre at increasing levels of tilt, uh, the systolic blood pressure, mean blood pressure, and to a lesser extent the diastolic blood pressure, they fall across the board in both the POTS patients and the control subject. And the mean blood pressure may be marginally different, marginally low in the POTS patient, patients compared to the controls. Systolic and diastolic really weren't. There wasn't an impressive difference in cerebral blood flow. So there seems to be a problem with executive function and selective memory. While seated, the executive function does seem to get worse in POTS patients when upright from Julian's data. But this does, doesn't seem to be due to blood flow to the head. It's not, it doesn't seem to be due to cerebral blood flow velocity. So for the final few minutes, um, that's fine. So what do we do? So I think it's important to say that there are no published studies looking at treatment strategies for this. And I appreciate it's a big problem. This morning I was already asked about how I feel about treatments for it. Um, 
you know, this is no man's land, no woman's land. This is, you know, uncharted territory. You know, you pay your money, you take your chances, right? There's no data really out there. I think a common strategy that people use are ADHD drugs, right? So we've shown that big problem with attention, uh, not as bad actually when quantitatively measured as ADHD patients, but sort of in that direction. And ADHD drugs largely fall into you know a couple of categories, but most of them are stimulants of some sort. So there's the amphetamines. A couple of brand names are listed here. They're slightly different from each other, but they're amphetamines. There's methylphenidate. Ritalin is a commonly used brand name. Again, there are a bunch. Atomoxetine. Uh, talked about this morning in one of our talks, but it's uh, it's, a, it's officially not a stimulant. But let's face it, it's a stimulant. Um, and all of these actually work by blocking transporters. They block. They typically block the dopamine transporter and they block the norepinephrine transporter. And whether it helps you or not, it's at least worth knowing that these can worsen heart rate. By worsen, I mean increase, right? I mean, if your heart rate is 10, increasing is good. But in this case, you have too much of a good thing, right? You don't want to increase that more. Some of you saw the slide earlier, but the reason for that, just to explain mechanistically what's going on, is this is a norepinephrine synapse. The little vesicles with red dots are the norepinephrine vesicles, the dots of norepinephrine being released. This end are the, it's the business end, right? These are the receptors that the norepinephrine wants to activate. When you release stuff into the synapse, most of it gets vacuumed up by this thing called NET, or the norepinephrine transporter. It's a clearance transporter, right? It's the normal function. So if you block NET, and all of these drugs do, then now the norepinephrine Less of it gets taken up and more of it lingers. So the net effect is you have increased sympathetic tone. And that's probably what's driving the heart rate. That's a theoretical concern. Um, we certainly anecdotally have reports. So eventually we actually looked at this when we were available using our sort of pilot study design. And we gave, in this case, atomoxetine, but a net inhibitor. Um, and you can see when standing over four hours, the placebo, the heart rate drops a little. It does in most of our studies. Um, it probably has to do with diurnal variability. But importantly, atomoxetine had the opposite effect. It made things worse. Standing heart rate increased. Seated heart rate, again here in red, increased. Orthostatic tachycardia increased. And perhaps more, most importantly, we rate, get people to rate symptoms using the Vanderbilt Orthostatic Symptom Score. Placebo made it marginally better over time. Again, diurnal variability, the atomosity made it worse. As I've said before, patients are heterogeneous, POTS is heterogeneous. So when we look at this data more closely, two-thirds of the patients reported a worsening of symptoms. One-third reported either it didn't get worse or it got marginally better in terms of scores. So it's possible this isn't everyone. This may not be you. But this is most of you, right? The majority of people respond this way. What about modafinil? Um, so it's gained increasing interest, uh, sometimes in the oddest of places. There are articles you can find about whether it's a performance-enhancing drug among grad students, um, relevant to the Olympics coming up. Um, so it's, it's basically, it's a wakefulness-promoting drug. It's indications for which it is approved, and it's daughter drugs are approved are sleep indications, narcolepsy, sleep shift work, sleep disorder, things like that. Um, but it will sometimes be used for fatigue and depression. This is off-label, so insurance coverage is a whole different kettle of fish in terms of trying to get this done. It has no ability to improve executive function and improve attention, which is probably why the, post -doc, the whole postdoc community was sort of arguing over whether it's reasonable to use it or not. So we actually were concerned about the heart rate effects of this drug as well, so we submitted modafinil to the same study design. You can see that really there wasn't a significant increase in heart rate with modafinil. We expected it to be, we went in expecting us to see a large increase and we didn't. Um, that was either in standing heart rate or orthostatic heart rate increases. Okay, so right now really the problem is there are treatment options, there's really no data as to what to do. So I would argue actually so this is a unique opportunity to actually enroll in clinical trials looking at this. Um, Cynthia Chabal sort of mentioned in the research update that there's an ongoing study right now. It probably won't be ongoing for much more than another six to 12 months, at most, maybe less. But it's looking at um, 
the use of modafinil and cognitive function in POTS. So it's saying, basically trying to address this issue. And I'll tell you, and Amy Arnold is the PI on it. I actually designed this study. This is a difficult study to design because most of the psych assessments, the neuropsychiatric tools, are confrontation assessments, right? We dump something in front of you and see how you react to it, and there's now a surprise issue. If you're trying to study something in a repeated way, it turns out the second time you do it, not as surprised, right? And so, so there's, there's a problem in doing that. Um, so we ended up having to sort of look at tools, and we actually are using something called Cogstate, which is a computer-based tool that was originally developed for serial assessments of disorders such as Alzheimer's, right? So the idea is it's, it can, the paradigm is the same, but the details change enough so you don't remember from one to the other exactly what to, where to go or what to do. So we want to test whether acute administration of modafinil improves seated cognitive function. Um, that's our primary goal, really. The secondary goal is to see whether propranolol, either by itself or with modafinil, improves cognitive function. And the reason is that many of our patients are on propranolol, and we certainly use that with modafinil clinically um, when trying to sort of mutter through this. So it's a multi-day study on the Vanderbilt CRC. The first day is sort of baseline characterization, autonomic testing, training on the Cogstate tool, um, and then basically there are four study days, modafinil and placebo, propranolol and placebo, modafinil and propranolol, or placebo and placebo. Right, so we can really try and tease out you know, what's doing what. On the study days, you know, seated for most of the time, we'll do Cogstate assessments a few hours in after study drug, and at the very end, um, we'll do standing assessments at baseline and at the very end. There's a standing assessment of Cogstate at the end. And then there's some sort of visual analog scales and anxiety and uh, depression symptom scores to see how these are affected by these study drugs. Uh, Amy Arnold, the PI, uh, she and I are both physically not at Vanderbilt most days, but it's uh, studies ongoing, and Bonnie Black, our nurse coordinator, uh, is, is still actively recruiting. If anyone's interested, please consider emailing Bonnie. The best email is probably ADC Research, all one word, at manual.edu. ADC is Autonomic Dysfunction Center. That's where we came up with it. Um, and be patient. Give it a few days, and, and you, your email will be responded to. So in conclusion, POTS patients have problems with sleep quality, with insomnia, with sleep latency, some measures of executive function, some problems with selective attention. So there are problems out there. There are problems that we can quantify, which is really the first step to trying to figure out how to treat something. But at this point, there really aren't effective treatments that are known. There's a paucity of studies. I think we're at the beginning of that. There is an ongoing study, and I'd ask you to consider enrolling. Thank you. Have you guys talked to people in the therapy world about what we do with that on the 
neuro we have side, or have we not linked those worlds yet? I guess is my question. Um, so probably the latter. Uh, yeah. So what I would argue is that I, I don't doubt that what you say is true, but you know we're able to. So I'd, I'd say two things. I think you know you hit it on the head when you said we don't exactly know what it is, and it's something called brain fog. And the question is, are these all the same things, or are these different things? And the second thing is, you know, how much of this is, you know, associated with these other physiologic changes that are acutely getting worse? In our study day paradigm, where we're, where we're um, doing the assessments in a supine state, for the most part, we weren't sort of dynamically challenging that. I'll tell you, as a Vanderbilt, I sat on a, a research review committee, and, and there's lots of stuff, certainly in the breast cancer world, you know, where people are looking at brain fog. I'm not sure that they have the answers either. If you guys think you've solved it, shoot me an email, send me some articles of what you've done, because I'm certainly open right. to well, it. Personally, but I, I don't know that there's a rock science solution, but if there's a lot of therapeutic strategies that you can use, but they're never the same. On right. any given day, because you're dealing with a different subset of symptoms on any given day. And the question is, are they the same from one disorder to another? Right. right? I mean, it's cancer. I mean, we see it a lot. It's in a lot of disorders, that's true. The question is, is it the same thing? Right. Maybe. I don't know. I have a question about, um, actually it was on your first slide, and I was wondering why you changed the birth control pill from Yaz to Desigen, and does minoxidil um, decrease hormones like estrogen in the body? So, second question about whether modafinil decreases estrogen, I have no idea. I haven't heard that it does, but I never looked at it. Okay. So, the, uh, so the birth control, so I, um, wanted her off of Yaz, I didn't care what she went on. So there are, uh, so Yaz and its family of birth control agents, and when I saw her, it was the number one selling birth control agent. I think the lawsuits have decreased that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but Yaz, Yasmin, and Ocella uh, all contain a progesterone agent called drosperinone, which is a structural analog of spermolactone. So if you remember, what Yaz actually got in trouble with the FDA for was saying that they cured uh, PMS symptoms, right? They cure the bloating and stuff like that. And I actually believe that they probably really did think they did. And the reason is because trisperinone, so spironolactone, which trisperinone actually functions like, blocks aldosterone, right? So it's, it blocks the receptor Flornac works on. And so to the extent that we're trying to increase blood volume, this probably actually decreased salt retention and decreased blood volume, which is why it decreases the bloating and the other symptoms it claims it did for PMS. But in a patient population where we're trying to increase blood volume, it seems counterproductive. And so it's not that I wanted to get pregnant, but you know, trying to do it with something that's not going to worsen the blood volume. Thank you. Um, so uh, a lot of talks, I also have bachelor's thesis um, every day. I've been having an hour after I eat in the morning. Uh, without fail, What do you for breakfast? It's, it's different things every day. I could be eating a, you know, like toast bag, I could be eating cereal. Um, so the, the short, there's a short and a long answer. The short answer is, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the slightly longer answer, though, is, um, so one of the studies that Cindy Chabal was talking about this morning that isn't underway yet, but she's getting through ethics right now, is looking at something along those lines, right? So um, she's done work in, a fair bit of work in an orthostatic hypotension population, it's a different patient population with postprandial hypotension. And a specific study was looking at an anti-diabetes drug that affects glucose absorption, and it actually decreases the postprandial hypotension. Right? So some of uh, the postprandial hypotension is actually related to glucose. It's probably indirect. Some of it is blood flow related. Some of it's insulin mediated, we think. And I think, you know, from what you're describing, there could be something similar, right? When you're eating, you're sort of generating, as, as your gut's getting this load, one, there's a fluid shift to your gut. That's probably part of it. But there's also an insulin release in the body that's physiologic, that we, that's part of digestion. And so the question I have for you, if you get really tired, is 
if this is this sort of a version of that. But there's a study, I think, that's actually trying to look at this a little more closely in a POTS, subgroup of POTS patients. Um, so I'm not closely involved with that study, but again, if you contact Vanderbilt, it sounds like it may address just the issue that you're, you're complaining about. So modafinil as opposed to some which other drug? Oh, and, uh, the, the newer one that one that lasts longer than armodafinil division. So because our interest in modafinil and, and our stance probably started before armodafinil was out. Um, and really my hope was that as armodafinil came out, modafinil came off patent, it would get cheaper than it has. Like armodafinil is very expensive. It was cheaper than modafinil right at the end because of a because of a company strategy to try and get people to switch. Um, so the reason for the acute study, most of the studies of Vanderbilt are acute. When you're doing a study design with a series of days like this, where it's back-to-back -back days, because you need people to come and hang out for a week, um, you need drugs that'll wash out, right? So if I'm giving you modafinil today, and I'm studying something else tomorrow, I need the modafinil today to be gone. So if you pick some of the longer half-life, that's less of an issue. So it's a study strategy. So if this works, is it important to get longer term data? Probably. That's a little tougher to get in some ways. And, and you know, this if we showed that this worked, that would probably provide a foundation for a longer term study. But it's hard to put people through long term studies, uh, you know, a blinded drug with multiple crossovers without some data suggesting it's probably worthwhile. Yeah, it's very difficult to find any kind of research within a long term administration of that or armor that for people who've been diagnosed with the impact. There's a problem long term with most drugs. I mean, you could argue that even cardiovascular drugs, which are probably the best studied, you know, a long study is three years, and people may be on it for 20 years. So there's sort of a bigger structural issue with how studies are done and funded. Um, so I think, and that's true actually for most non cognitive therapies as well. Our propranol data is, most of the data that are presented, they're acute data. Um, and we've talked about maybe doing long term studies, it probably would be more something hemodynamic, looking at sort of broader symptoms. And the question is, how many people could we get to participate over a period of time, you know, away from the unit? And it's something we're looking into. Thanks a lot. Do you want Dr. Kim to be the last question? Yeah, and then whoever else has questions. Okay. Just wait until you ask us for a second. Until I take my kids swimming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so one more, and then they can see you ask. Hi, Mr. Fitch. There's a subgroup of patients with autism who have some various and this antibody is described with blood uh, transfer of folic acid into the CNS. And this is uh, countermeasured by the using of reduced and somebody reported improvement in that. And I wondered if you commented on that because I got any more of your talk of what the thoughts are of that. Next question. <laughs> I got nothing, I'm sorry. <laughs> On the sleep side of things, have you had any experience with the digital wallet simulator? Do you know what it is? <laughs> no, it sounds potentially very exciting. <laughs> just, just as a note for people who have severe insomnia, my daughter had very severe insomnia. We tried. <clears throat> basically everything um, that a sleep doctor would do. And then we found this official wall simulator here, another doctor. It was developed by NASA for the astronauts. And it's a little electronic stimulator that you put these pads on either side of your temples and you sit there for 20 minutes with it. And it helps uh, increase your serotonin levels without taking drugs. And it works for her. So it was the only thing that really worked. This is restore her. commercially available, or do you have to go to NASA? And no, you can, you can get it. They have a website, Fisher Wallace. Good to know. Yep. It was a Fisher Wallace stimulator. It sounds like sort of a transcutaneous electrical stimulation of the temporal area. Okay. Thanks for coming.